Okay, so today we will cover chapter 8. All right, and this is all about hypothesis testing. And we are dealing with hypothesis testing for population proportions. Okay. And this is our continuation of statistical inference, which allows us to make conclusions about the population, even if all the data we have comes from just a sample. Okay. Sure. Um, let's see. Okay, so yes. Or, or you can move cl closer as well. So we are uh, making, um, so statistical inference allows us to make conclusions about the population based on a sample of data. So we're not observing the entire sample, I mean entire population, we're just observing a sample and using that, we're going to make conclusions about the population. We did a little bit of that last week with the creation of what? You guys just did it on your quiz. Uh, yeah, what, yeah, I'm asking, what did you guys learn how to make last week? Or what? What tool did you use last week to allow you to make conclusions about the population? Confidence, Confidence intervals. intervals. Okay, there we go. That's what I was looking for. I was almost uh, ready to be disheartened here. Um, so you learn confidence intervals, which also allow you to make conclusions about the population, even though you observe just a sample. Today we are extending that. We're doing hypothesis testing. and. This week, we will learn about how to do hypothesis testing for proportions. Next week, we will learn hypothesis testing for means as well as confidence intervals for means. And that will be the bulk of what we cover. Chapter 12, or uh, the week after next, we get into some nitty gritty of hypothesis testing, just a little bit more details. Uh, along with a review of sampling methods. And that will be it for uh, new material. So this week, next week, and the week after will be it for new material. After that, we will have a review. And then after that will be a final exam. Yes? Okay, so the final exam is cumulative? The final exam is cumulative in the sense that, yes, it does cover stuff from before the midterm, but there will definitely be a heavy emphasis on stuff from after the midterm. Okay, so again, why do we study statistics? It allows us to make conclusions about the population based on limited data, okay? And so with hypothesis testing, there's always a question that we are trying to investigate, right? There's some kind of research question. Um, Okay, this is what we want to investigate. And what we do with hypothesis testing is we turn our research qu question, the thing we want to investigate, and we turn it into a pair of hypotheses that we can test. Okay, that's the key. You can't just turn them into whatever hypotheses. We've got to turn them into testable hypotheses. So um, we turn our research question into a pair of hypotheses that we can test. And so the pair of hypotheses 
These are called, one of them is called the null hypothesis and the other is called the alternative hypothesis, okay? So we will always have two hypotheses. So these are, these are the two hypotheses, okay, the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The symbols for the null hypothesis is H with a zero, okay? So it's also called H naught, not as in N-A-U-G-H-T, it was all for not, I don't, I don't know who speaks like that anymore, but um, you got H0 and HA, okay? It's the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And when we say uh, they are testable, okay, to make the hypotheses in, in a way that we can test them, we always, in the null hypothesis, there's always an equal sign, okay? The null hypothesis will always will always have an equal sign in it. Okay. Uh, or in other words, it always states that something, the value of something is equal to a particular value. Okay. So it all it will always That uh, population parameter, okay, so I know this also sounds very abstract, okay, um, after tonight, and we do a few examples. You know, go, go back through your notes and just make sure you understand all of these terms and things like that, okay? Yes? Uh, it will always state that a po population parameter has a particular value, yes, not valve. As a particular, has a particular value, okay. And in our process, we will assume the way we test the hypothesis is we assume that the null hypothesis is true until there is enough evidence for us to doubt that null hypothesis. So we always assume one thing until something along comes along the way that causes us <coughs> to doubt it. Okay, so in the process, No, uh, yeah, so in the process of hypothesis testing, we will assume that the null hypothesis is true until there is enough evidence to doubt to doubt or convince us that it is not true. Okay. 
So you can kind of think of this as almost like a, a trial. Okay, and so in our justice system, whenever the, a defendant is put on trial, what, we assume that the defendant is, is innocent, right? Until proven guilty. So, so we, without, if no evidence is presented, we assume the de defendant is innocent. The defendant may or may not be innocent, but we just assume that the defendant is innocent. Now, if a lot of evidence is presented, against um, that makes you doubt his, his or her innocence, okay, if enough evidence is presented, then the jury or judge may make a guilty verdict. Okay, they may reject that presumption of innocence. But if only a little bit of evidence is presented, then the judge or jury will just presume innocence, and that will be, that will be it. Okay, and, uh, and it doesn't prove, so a lack of evidence does not prove that the uh, defendant is innocent, okay? But we treat the defendant as innocent because there is the presumption of innocence. And so in hypothesis testing, we will presume, we will assume that the null hypothesis is true, okay? And when there's enough evidence against it, then we will reject the null hypothesis. But if there's not enough evidence, we just go on assuming that the null hypothesis is true. It doesn't prove that the null hypothesis is true, but we just go on assuming that it is. Is, is that okay? All right, so we assume until there's enough evidence to doubt or convince us that it is not true, If there is not enough evidence, okay, we continue to assume that the null hypothesis is true, okay, but note that this does not prove. that the null hypothesis is indeed true. Was there a question? Yes. You may have said this, and this may be a dumb question, but I'm still kind of confused on what the null hypothesis really is. Is it sort of like the working premise we initially think, and it's what we're going with until we prove otherwise? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, exp I'll give you some examples that I hope kind of put this into a better context. But it's um, the way we try to prove our point, OK? Uh, the way we try to, you know, if you think of a criminal trial or a criminal case, the way we try to prove the point that this person is guilty is first we give them the presumption of innocence, yeah. and then we present evidence against that until it convinces the judge or jury that this person is guilty. Okay, And so in our case, we're going to assume one thing, and this is called the null hypothesis, and then our data we look at our data and we ask, does this data go against this assumption? Okay. And if it does, if it does then that means that assumption must be wrong. You, go to the alternative. you go to the alternative, exactly. Okay. And if there's not enough data, then you just say, well, we're going to just continue assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Okay. So, uh, does everyone have this down? We can go on to the next slide, and we'll we'll talk about some. Uh, We'll do some examples here. Okay, I'll give you a moment to finish writing.
Okay, so here we go. So let's say um, someone says uh, I think that I think that um, I can tell the difference uh, between, I don't know, tell the difference between um, Coke and Pepsi blindfolded. Coke and Pepsi blindfolded. Okay. Or whether blindfolded or not. I guess if you pour it into an unlabeled cup, you won't know the difference, right? Okay. So we have to ask so this person is saying he or she can tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi, okay? So the, um, there's, there's two possible scenarios, OK? And, uh, and I'm not going to label this null an alternative hypothesis, but one is um, uh, he has this ability, and the other is he does not have this ability. So these are these are our two possible things, right? He either has the ability or he doesn't. Okay. Now, how can we test this, right? So this is this is our research question: Can this guy actually tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi blindfolded, or whatever, in a blind taste test? Okay. How can we turn this into a, a testable thing? Okay. So if he does not have this ability, and he's just guessing whether something is Coke or Pepsi, how often will be, he be right? Huh? 50% of the time, right? He's just going to, if he's just guessing if something is Coke or Pepsi, and he actually can't tell the difference, he should be right about 50% of the time, right? So, so this is how we're going to set it up, right? Uh, to test. To test his ability, maybe we will line up 20 cups of soda or 20 cups of uh, Coke and Pepsi and ask if he can identify which is which. Okay, so um, if he has no ability, then just by from random guessing, he should be correct at least 50% of the time. And if he actually has the ability, then he should guess what? OK, so, so if he does have the ability, he should be correct more than 50% of the time, right? Does this make sense to everybody? 
Okay, and so to turn this into a hypothesis test, okay, with hypotheses, our null hypothesis. This is what we're going to assume is true, unless the data shows us otherwise, and there has to be an equal sign, is that we're going to say P, P being his proportion of guessing correctly, what are we going to say P is equal to? under a null hypothesis. <coughs> We're going to say that P is equal to 50%. So our null hypothesis is going to assume he has no ability to guess. Right, he has no ability to tell the difference. And if anything he gets right is just from random guessing. OK, so this, the null hypothesis assumes he has no ability to identify Coke or Pepsi. Is, is this okay? Okay, and so what would the alternative hypothesis be? Okay, so this is essentially um, kind of like the null hypothesis. So the alternative will be that his ability to correctly identify Coke or Pepsi is over 50%. So we're not using 0% or 100%. We're just saying, is this guy just randomly guessing? Or can he actually do this thing? OK? Is that OK? All right. So what if, uh, so what if we line up 20, 20 cans or 20 cups of soda, and, uh, and he goes down the line, and he correctly identifies 11 of them? And he says, see? I got 11 out of 20 correct. That means I can do it. What do you feel? Huh? So, so 11 out of 20 is more than 50%, right? So if he gets 11 out of 20, do, would you be convinced that he can actually tell the difference? Uh, yeah, you're shaking your head no. What? He just got lucky with that one extra thing, right? Uh, and, and I would argue the same, right? Because anybody just guessing might guess 11 out of 20 correctly anyway, OK? What if he gets uh, 12 out of 20? Would he be convinced? 13 out of 20, 14 out of 20? How, how many does he have to get correct out of 20 for you to be convinced <laughs> that he can actually 15, okay, so, we're, no, okay, so we're, getting, we're getting different answers here, right? Some are saying, oh, he's got to get 15 right, and others say 18 right or something, you know, or maybe 13. So this is where statistics and probability come in, where rather than just saying, uh, here's a number where I feel like this is going to convince me, we're going to actually have the math to kind of back it up, okay? So, um, so we're we'll see wh how many he would have to actually get correct for us to be convinced that he can tell the difference, OK? So we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll, I want to do a, a few, uh, few more of these, turning our research question into hypotheses, because this is a very important step. If we can't <coughs> do this step of turning a research question into a hypothesis, the rest of our progress will, will not be any good. OK. So, one thing, please note that in this case, because he's making a claim that he can tell the difference, we're doing 50% versus something over 50%. Okay, So here we use a greater than sign. Okay, And 
this means it is a one-sided test. Okay, so whenever you use the greater than side sign, this is a also known as a one-sided test. Okay, one-sided test is when uh, you use the greater than sign or less than sign. Okay, is for alternative hypotheses with greater than or less than in them. Okay, so let's um, let's do that. And then we're going to go to uh, we'll do another example of turning a research question into a pair of hypotheses. Okay, so maybe um, last year a survey was performed. Okay, and the results show that um, the percentage of all Americans who like to eat, I don't know, Taco Bell is what percentage of Americans like Taco Bell? 95. <laughs> uh, all right, I don't know. We'll, we'll, yeah. So it's just a question, right? We ask you, we call you up and we say, do you like to eat Taco Bell? And you say yes or no. And we will give, uh, we'll give them 36%, uh, okay? And uh, we wanna know has uh, this percentage changed this year? Well, I don't know, maybe the number is higher, I don't know. Do you like Taco Bell, yes or no? Okay. Not is it your favorite restaurant ever. <laughs> Um, okay, so in this case, how can we test this to see if it has changed? So in one thing, we're going to assume it hasn't changed, and then we're going to see if the data convinces us that it has changed, okay? So either it's still 36% or it's no longer 36%. Okay, so in our case, our hypotheses will be our null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0.36. This basically states the proportion has not changed. And then the alternative will be that it's not 36%. Okay, the proportion has changed. Okay, and so in this case, we proportion has changed. We are interested if the proportion is larger or smaller. Whereas before, because he claimed that he could tell the difference, we would only be interested if his correct identification is over 50%. In this case, we would be interested if the proportion is larger or smaller than 0.36, okay?
So in this case, okay, the use of the not equal sign means it is a <coughs> two-sided test. Okay. All right, important rules. Hypotheses are always about a population parameter. Okay, they're always about the population. Okay, so for proportions. we will always use p in the hypothesis. Okay, we will never use p hat. And then whatever number shows up in the hypothesis, so in this case, 0.36, okay, and notice we use the same number in both the null and alternative. This number, whatever number you have there, that is known as P0, okay, because it shows up in the null hypothesis. Okay, so whatever. number appears in hypothesis is known as p0, at least for proportions. Okay, So for proportions, it's known as p0. When we deal with means and mu, it'll be known as mu0. But for proportions, it's known as p0. Okay, so let's um, let's try an example. Well, let's uh, let me define a few things. Okay, so the process of finding um, of doing a hypothesis test. Okay. So the first step is you find or write the appropriate hypotheses. Okay. So you have a null hypothesis which will state p is equal to some value, uh, p0, okay, where p0 is some number, okay? And then the alternative is going to be p not equal to p0, or uh, we'll use greater than or less than, okay? So not necessarily not equal to, but it could use the greater than or less than sign. Okay. Okay. 
And the second step is we're going to calculate the p-value of our data. Okay. The p-value, so this is a, an important definition. I'll start. is the probability of observing our data by random chance if we assume if we assume that the null hypothesis is true. Okay. And so for proportions with one sample, the p-value is, is found this way. Okay. This is how we do it. Proportions with one sample to find the p-value. Okay, we first calculate the standard error. The standard error is the square root of p0 minus times 1 minus p0 over n. This should look familiar to something else. You, you, the standard error for a confidence interval uses p hat. Okay, So don't mix those two up. They, they look very similar, but don't mix it up with the standard error for a confidence interval. Confidence interval uses p hat times 1 minus p hat over n. Standard error for a hypothesis test uses p0, p0 being the number that appears in your null hypothesis, okay? So don't mix up with standard error for a confidence interval, which I'm going to abbreviate as CI. which uses p hat. <clears throat> Is that okay? Bless you. Okay. And you're going to calculate a test statistic which is always in the form of observed minus null value divided by standard error. So in our case, our test statistic, this is known as a z, uh, it will be in the, uh, a z-score actually. And the test statistic is the proportion that we observe. What is the symbol we use for a proportion that we observe in our sample? No? A sample proportion? The proportion we observe in our sample, what's that? P hat. P hat, exactly. Okay, so the observed value from our sample is P hat. What is the value that appears in our null hypothesis? What's the number that shows up in our null hypothesis? What is that called? P0, okay. That's the number that appears in our null hypothesis, or null value. And the standard error is this thing over here, right? So this will be our z-score, okay? 
And then to get the p-value, p hat is our sample proportion. Right, it's, so it's the test statistic. The test statistic is your observed thing mm -hmm. minus the null value divided by the standard error. So in our case, what we observe when we're dealing with proportions of one sample, what we observe is p hat. Okay. okay? We'll, we'll do an example and I'll, I'll try to explain everything, okay? Okay, and then we then look up the z-score in the z-table. Okay. That's step three. Yeah, this, well, this is all part of calculating the p-value of our data, okay? So... So we find the standard error, we find the test statistic, then we look up the z-score in the z-table, okay, and we find the area in the tail, okay, and, uh, and let me further illustrate that. So I'm, I'm just dumping all of this information out onto you, okay? So you'll have it in your notes, and then we'll go through the process, okay? So I, I realize that all of this is very abstract the first time you're exposed to it, and it's just like P and Ns and Zs and Ts, okay? It's, it's just a lot, and then we're going to work through the process, and I'm, I'm hoping it will make more sense, okay? I'm hoping it will make sense at the end of the night, but I'm just dumping all of this information at you right now, okay? So we're going to find the area in the tail. So this is all still part of calculating the p-value of our data. Okay, can I go to the next slide? Okay, so again, we've, we have a test statistic, right? This is our z-score. We're gonna we look this up in the z table. Okay, so to get our tail area, so if the alternative has a greater than sign, okay, the p value is equal to the area to the right of z. So you basically, you, you look that up in your z-table, and you do 1 minus that to get the area to the right, right? If the alternative has less than, the p-value is equal area to the left of z. I'm sorry, I left out the word area here. And if the alternative has not equal sign, the p-value is equal to two times the area away uh, from zero. Okay, so. Depending on what your z-score is, it's either this times 2 or the area away from, away from the 0, 0 being in the middle, right? Or this times 2. So if your z-score is like 1.7, you would be 1.7 times 2? Not 1.7. You take the area and then times it, multiply it by 2. So if your z-score is 1.7, you are above 0, right? Okay, so you take the area to the left or to the right? We want the area away from 0, 
So if it's above 1.7, you take the area to the right, and you take that area and you multiply it by 2. So don't, take, don't do 1.7 times the z-score, or, or 2 times the z-score. You want the area, and then you multiply the area times 2. Okay? So that, that's an important note. Okay? Always deal with the area. and not the z-score itself. Okay. All right, and then so lastly, once we get our p-value, we make our conclusion. Okay. So often there is an arbitrary value alpha. will be an R, uh, uh, a value called alpha. Alpha, known, also known as the significance level. OK, this is, this symbol is alpha. And it's known as the significance level, OK? Um, and the rule is, if the p-value is less than alpha, this provides evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, And if the p-value is larger than alpha, then there is not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? If alpha is not specified in the problem, Assume alpha equals 0 0.05. OK. You got all that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was kind of a joke. Thanks for laughing. Um, so. We'll, we'll work through this, okay? And we'll, we'll try to uh, try to make sense of all of this, okay? Uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll work through the example and then we'll take a break, okay? All right, can I go to the next slide? Is anyone still writing? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, I, don't, I don't really understand what you mean when you say uh, with the area. So, well, you look up a z-score in the table, right? Yeah. The z-table always gives you an area. OK, so um, you look up the z, and based on these rules, this will decide if you look at the area to the right to determine what your p-value is. So your p-value is basically an area that you get from your z-table. Okay, that's, that's what a p-value is. Okay? It's, but it's 
the definition of the p-value is the probability of observing your data or something more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. That's, that's the definition of the p-value. But basically, on a practical level, the p-value that you get in these tests is going to be an area from the z-table. And so he, these are the rules as do you use the area to the left, the area to the right, or two times the area away from zero. Okay, And so we'll, we'll talk about all of this. OK. One more second. All right, is this OK? OK, so let's go back to our friend who says he can tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi. OK? Can he tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi? Or is he just guessing? OK, so we, uh, we line them up with, uh, we have 20 cups. And we mix them up. And uh, he correctly identifies. Fifteen out of twenty. Twenty drinks. Okay. Does this convince you that he can distinguish Coke and Pepsi? So again, earlier we established our hypotheses will be this. P is equal to 0.5, and the alternative is that P is greater than 0.5. Is, it, is that OK? And we said, why do we choose 0.5? Right, because if he's just guessing whether it's Coke or Pepsi, how often should he be correct? He should be correct 50% of the time just from random guessing. Okay. And, and he's claiming that he actually has this ability, so we're testing it against the alternative that his guessing ability to guess correctly is greater than 50%. Okay. So what does our data show? Our data shows his percentage correct, or a proportion of correct guesses is what? Is 15 over 20, or a proportion of 0.75? Is that OK? So our p hat is equal to 0.75. OK, so let's, let's take a look here. So we're going to calculate our p value. Okay? And the process for calculating the p value to get to get the p-value, what do we have to do? We have to get our standard error, which is equal to the square root of p0 times 1 minus p0 over n. And then we're going to get our z, which is p hat minus p0 over the standard error. And then we, we look up z in the table. Okay, so this is, this is kind of uh, the quick rundown of our process. 
Uh, obviously, I'm leading, leaving off a lot of details here, um, but I'll, I'll talk through all of this. Okay, so in our problem, we're going to calculate the standard error. What is P0 in our problem? I'll let you guys finish writing all of this first, so that at least we can be engaged when I'm asking these questions. Okay, so P0 is the value in our null hypothesis, which is 0.5, exactly, okay? So we're going to use 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5. And what is N? What is our sample size? 20, right? 20 drinks. Okay, so our standard error is going to be 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5 divided by 20. Okay, and then I'm going to take the square root of that. And I get 0 0.1118. Is that all right? OK, and so our z-score is p hat minus p0 divided by the standard error. So what is that in our case? 0.75 minus 0.5 divided by 0.1118. Okay. 0.75 minus 0.5 divided by that, I get a z-score of 2 point, rounding to two decimal places, 2.24. 2.236, I round to two decimal places because I'm going to look this up in the z-table. And I get 2.24. So far, so good with everybody? OK, now, what do we have in our alternative hypothesis? We have a greater than sign. Okay. And so because we have a greater than sign, that means when we go to our z table, the area we write down is the area to the right. Okay? So this is these are all of the rules. Okay? So because the alternative has a greater than sign, our p value so this should all be in your notes. And you know if you don't have it all memorized right now, that's OK. As we do examples, these rules will become familiar to you. Okay? Because our alternative has a greater than sign, our p value will be the area to the right. OK, so we want, what is the area to the right? Area to the right. Of 2.24. What is that? We we go to our z table and we're going to look up the area to the right of 2.24. Okay. Okay. So because the alternative hypothesis has a greater than sign, our p value will be the area to the right. So I look up 2.24 in the z table. And I get 0 0.9875. 0 0.9875. OK. Is that the answer? No. The area to the right will then be what? 1 minus 0 0.9875. Is that OK? Because the table always gives you the area to the left. So that means. I do 1 minus 0 0.9875, 0 0.0125. OK, so what this means is that if our friend was truly guessing whether something was Coke or Pepsi, 
then he should only get um, the probability that he just guesses 15 out of 20 correctly, that would happen only 1% 1, 1 of the time, okay, or 1 and a quarter percent of the time. It could happen by random chance, but it only happens about 1% of the time, 1 and a quarter percent of the time. So do you think he just got lucky and got 15 out of 20 correct? Or maybe he can actually kind of tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi. Okay, and, and so we would say, okay, you probably didn't just guess this. You, didn't, you probably didn't get 15 out of 20 correct just by guessing. Maybe you actually know a little bit about the difference between Coke and Pepsi. Okay? You're obviously not super great because you didn't get 100% or you, you only got 15 out of 20, but it's not just random guessing. Okay. So in our case, because this p-value, this, this is our p-value, our p-value is small. Uh, the alpha was not specified, so we're assuming 5%. Okay. Because our p-value is less than 5%, we will reject the null hypothesis and say this provides evidence that he can correctly identify drinks more than half the time, meaning he's not just guessing when he's getting 15 out of 20 correct. So I will write that down, OK? So our p-value is equal to 0 0.0125. This means. that if he was just guessing and had no idea if a drink was Coke or Pepsi, okay, the probability that he gets 15 out of 20 correct from guessing alone is 0 Our p-value is less than alpha equal to 0 0.05. Okay, so uh, we assume alpha is 0 0.05 if it is not stated. Zero one two five is less than point zero five. <coughs> so we reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Oops. He got fifteen out of twenty provides evidence.
So the fact that he got 15 out of 20 correct provides evidence that he is not just guessing at random. Whew. Is that okay? I'll let this sink into your brain. All right, we'll take a short break and uh, we'll continue on after.